all of you this evening. I'm Bill Lipsky. I'm a docent here on most Saturdays. Um, my memory still allows me to remember that most Saturdays. And I'm certainly glad. There's some seats down in front if you like. <clears throat> uh, I'm certainly glad to, to greet the immediate world out here tonight. Um, and I very much appreciate so many of you giving up your disco nap to be ah, with us. Ah, ah, ah. So this evening we are going to be having an uh, interesting conversation about the past 40 years. I'm very interested to find out what I missed at all those parties I went to. Um, and we've been enjoying the, the film, the images by Rink. Uh, and thank you, and Jen, I know where she has won. There's Jen, put that together for us. Uh, the material collection is, is priceless. It's, it's wonderful. Now I can see the places that sort of I have foggy images of. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get more phone numbers. That would have been, been helpful now, but I, um, I guess not. Um, before, um, I embarrass myself further. I'd like to introduce uh, our executive director, um, Terry Beswick, who has a few words. Terry! Thank you, Bill. We had that backwards. I was supposed to introduce him, but anyway. Um, yeah, I'm Terry Beswick, and I've been the executive director here at the Historical Society for um, going on three years now. I can't believe it. I, 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 my hair wasn't quite so gray uh, three years ago, but, uh, <laughs> uh, and Bill is one of our, our, our core volunteers as well as being uh, one of our great community historians, and I just picked up his book, actually, uh, so that I can finally learn a little bit about the gay history of San Francisco, so thank you very much for thank writing that and it. putting it together. What's the title of the book? <laughs> what is it called? Gay San Francisco or Gay and Lesbian? Gay and Lesbian San Francisco, and I appreciate the royalty payment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll get a check, I'm sure. <laughs> Thanks for selling them at the Historical Society. So, the Historical Society, we're celebrating our, what is it now, 33rd year, um, and uh, we're having our uh, annual gala to celebrate that uh, next week. Donna, I sent you an email today, are you coming? Uh, I'm on the spot now. All right. <laughs> so, uh, we uh, started in the Castro, actually, in a, a fellow by the name of Willie Walker's uh, living room. He had a few boxes of uh, periodicals and clippings, and... Uh, uh, and he joined forces with other, you know, <clears throat> history nerds and Gerard. Gerard was one of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eric Garber. <laughs> Eric Garber, Gail Rubin. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 so anybody else? Oh, yeah. I think Paula, too. Paula Kidburg is here, yes. Jeffrey Jeffrey. 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 So we try to remember, yeah, Jeffrey Scopier. Um, we, so we try to remember our history of our own organization. But we have a, a much larger archives now. We've moved several times. And we're in the mid-market area of San Francisco. If you want to come down there and make an appointment, you can you know, check out the Bay Times that we have up on the shelves and, and uh, actually uh, volunteer with us also and do your own research if you like. Uh, the museum we opened here seven years ago. Um, we're very proud of it. Uh, the main uh, exhibit in here, actually, uh, Bill uh, was one of the co-curators of the ancient past exhibit over here. <laughs> and Paula. And with Paula Lichtenberg. And uh, then we kind of go around the room and have a uh, number of different exhibits. But, you know, they're all uh, wonderful. They give a little window, a little snapshot of our uh, amazing diverse queer history. But they're too small. And that's the main thing that we have to say about them, this exhibit over here about Harvey Milk. Obviously, we could have the entire museum about, about any one of these particular exhibits. Um, and that's really the driving force behind my work on a daily basis, is to try to establish a much larger museum in San Francisco, together with our archives, uh, which will be the first, one of the first anywhere in the world. I think there's a small wow. museum in uh, uh, Berlin, the Schulz Museum. Uh, but there's, there is nothing that uh, really embraces the full history of uh, the queer community, uh, which is you know, so vast and so difficult to try to actually interpret and present it in a way that everyone feels 
like uh, you know they can find themselves or their own stories or their chosen families in, in our exhibits. But so we deal with a lot of you know concern around that. But the greatest thing for me about this museum, and if you have chance, a chance. How many people have never been to the museum here before? Can I just ask? Don't be ashamed. Uh, my roommates, I live across the street, they haven't been in here either, but I can't. <laughs> um, but uh, the best thing for me is just to go through the guest book up in the front. If you just take through there and just randomly open the different comments from visitors to the museum, I always get my batteries recharged and I'm, I'm excited because, you know, people actually, they're, they're amazed when they are, don't live in this little bubble that we have, uh, that we have something like this. You know, and that we put on events like this, and so uh, I think it's really powerful. Just uh, you know, and you know, people bring their parents in here, and they, they leave all of them leave crying, and you know, we see it all the time uh, when we uh, work at the front desk. So, and in the front we have these two temporary walls uh, that allow us to just kind of rotate out and exhibit different parts of our, our history and our culture. Um, so check it out, the Angela Davis exhibit is actually coming down in the next week and we're coming in with a Rex Ray exhibit, posters from the 70s and 80s, um, and amazing art. And then uh, the exhibit over here, who is it over there, I can't forget it. Oh, the Briggs Initiative, of course, <laughs> we just opened that a couple weeks ago, uh, the Prop 6 uh, Briggs Initiative um, exhibit, which is really amazing and wonderful to have that uh, presented. So. How many people here are members of the Historical Society? Woo! Yay! I love you guys. And the rest of you. Uh, our memberships are only $30 a year, $50. And you can even go online and do a little payment plan on that. And then you get to come to these events for free. You get to bring, bring uh, guests to the uh, museum whenever you want. <laughs> Um, so check it out online, and we have a lot of uh, other events coming up. So I'm really excited about tonight's event because the Bay Times is very special to me. Uh, when I was coming of age uh, in the 80s, and I was an AIDS activist, and I uh, and uh, I think you know I, I was aware of the Bay Times, but I, I, I first really got to know the staff when I saw a, a, a job announcement for somebody to sell ads. Uh, so my best friend, uh, Nick Shelby, and I went over and I, I forced him to apply for this job selling ads because I knew he could and he was a crazy ad sales person. And really, didn't he? He like doubled the, the income probably overnight. And he, I mean, he would shake people down. Um, so, uh, and so I got to know the staff, Tim Kingston uh, uh, was a uh, great investigative reporter uh, at the Bay Times and during the era of AIDS. I just want to acknowledge, and I'm sure others will, but your contributions to uh, the narrative uh, and the fight uh, against AIDS uh, during that, uh, the 80s and 90s. And, and uh, so many others, Nan Parks uh, was writing for the Bay Times at the time, and uh, I think it's still a secret who, who she really was. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, so uh, that uh, 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 was, such a, a cornerstone of uh, San Francisco, and it still is, and I'm really excited to be here tonight to celebrate 40 years of the Bay Times and have our esteemed panel here. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bill Lipsky. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Gary. Gary. Thank you. Just first to, to build on what Terry said, I know this is a little crowded in here, and it's a little warm, and we're trying everything we can do to create a larger space. Hint, hint. On your way out, hint, hint, you will be able to help us do that. If you have friends, relatives, sisters, cousins, or aunts who are not yet members, membership makes a wonderful, wonderful birthday present, Halloween present, are the LGBTQ community. Christmas present, Hanukkah present, Kwanzaa present, oh. and whatever occasion you celebrate at any time that involves other people, present. <laughs> As Terry also said, we have always been here. <coughs> We've been here at least since the gold rush, probably before. Wow. There were, um, in 18... 
1848, when gold was discovered uh, by Sutter's Mill. And I should say that Native Americans discovered gold long before the people living at Sutter's Mill did. They just had the good sense not to tell anybody. <laughs> the Americans who were up there told everybody, look what my bling looks like, people. So we had a gold went from about 800 people to about 50,000 people. More than 90% of them were men. Wow. Women as, opposed to, <laughs> women as opposed to ladies were, pardon me, um, beyond their uh, income levels. Uh, it was expensive, so if you're going to tell me that 50,000 men in their physical and sexual primes well, abstained <laughs> for uh, two or three or five years. <laughs> uh, you're crazy. We are celebrating 40 years of that history this evening, and we're going to talk about it because in 1978, a remarkable group of men and women came together with a very, very radical idea. One, that men and women could come together and do something for the LGBT community. And two, that the individuals in the LGBT community should know what the other individuals in the community were doing. So that maybe the, the sweater queens of Polk Street would know what the leather boys of Folsom Street were doing. And believe me, if you didn't have a car with a trunk, you couldn't carry enough clothes. <laughs> because if you were going to go from Polk to Folsom, mm -hmm. you needed to be able to go from your sweater to your bar vest. You came over here, you needed your jeans and t-shirt. Uh, I vaguely remember that. <laughs> Whatever I was on at the time. Uh, and also that we had, as a community, more in common with each other than we might have had differences. Yes. Men are different than women. Ask your mother if you are unaware of that. Or ask your father if you are unaware of that or somebody. Uh, and women and men had different issues. Even in 1978, as Del Martin, who was the co-founder of the first women's organization in the United States said, men and women have different issues. Women are not caught with their pants down in Union Square, <laughs> to paraphrase. And that was true. But we did have issues in common that nobody should be arrested for trying to meet somebody else that they loved. And we were only legal less than, less than two, three years when this paper began. So that was quite a revolutionary set of ideas which over the 40 years the paper still has. Um, and we're going to hear a lot about that this evening. Before we do, because I'll get murdered otherwise, I want to recognize so many people that are involved in our being able to get together here tonight, starting with Betty and Jen. If you haven't noticed, we have a feast. Please uh, notice at some point. I want to thank Reef and Jen for putting this history show together. It's quite remarkable to look back at some of the men and women who have been here before. Um, I wanted to uh, recognize Sister Dana, who is a columnist. We're yeah. 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 Thank you. 
Donna is going to be roasted tomorrow. I don't know that anybody could say unkind about her. She is amazing. I should, I I should just it, wait. Please, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the roasters. Well, I do remember one brochure more that didn't quite match your purse. But oh. Oh. I oh. 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 Your contacts weren't in that. <laughs> I certainly think that was probably true. <laughs> and no one realizes she was born a man. Don't cut out me then. I don't know if it was, was identified as <laughs> I, I do not ask those questions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's more <laughs> long, man. So I imagine you're going to be roast, starting to roast. Oh, yeah, let's not judge the bar. <laughs> We need to roast, roast you. By the, roast, by the way, um, also benefits the Historical Society. Yes. So if there are any <laughs> tickets left, please please consider that. It's early enough that you can get in some some weeks before you go out to your evening. You can buy tickets at the door too. Oh, good. And uh, I think it's going to be a grand, grand success. In, in, in the interest of full disclosure, Don and I are, are both on the board of the Rainbow Honor Walk, so I can't say anything bad. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that roast to find out <laughs> what, what is, is bad. No cameras on that. No, no, no. <laughs> I also want to thank the people at the Historical Society because they don't often get thanked. Nalini and, and Jeremy and Patricia at the archives, so I know it's helped put some of the material together for tonight. And I'm sorry, I, I don't know your name, but thank you <laughs> for, for, for doing this stuff. Scott. Scott. Yeah. I also want to thank this amazing panel that we have here. Um, I don't know that they need introductions. If I did the introductions, would never get to the program. There is so much to say about it who they are and what they have done and their accomplishments over the years. Um, so let me just say, yeah, they got your names up, so uh, you're all, all set with that. What we are saying uh, this evening is we want to welcome Randy Alford, who is the founding news editor of the original Bay Times, and Susan Calico, who is the family production manager, and Cleve Jones, who in this particular instance was a founding contributor as well as everything else. <laughs> I don't remember any of that. <laughs> well, it was, well, it was 1978. Who remembers 1978? Uh, I wish I did, frankly. Uh, Raphael Mappelman, who is a former columnist with the Big Times and has got some other responsibilities at the, at the moment, <laughs> like being your supervisor. <laughs> everybody on the immediate planet um, on, the, on the Women's Commission and has been for many years and has made a significant contribution for many, many years to that. I wanted to read you something um, from a letter by uh, Emma Goldman. She didn't write this to me. <laughs> um, she wrote it to, to Magnus Hirschfeld, who was a, a German sexologist. Right and talked about people needing to recognize, in, in her words, various gradations and variations of gender and their great significance in life. I think the Bay Times began with that idea in mind, however they phrased it, and has continued to do that across the 40 years. So let's take a look back or at the beginning of the paper, the ideas that originally motivated and Randy Elf. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, now that you mentioned Emma Goldman, very few people know this. She lived for a while at 569 Dolores, no. facing the lower half of Dolores Park. Hmm. If you look at the, the San Francisco Chronicle's literary map of San Francisco, you will find it there. She came to San Francisco, it was less than a year, um, and if, 
it's a good place to, to look at and see. So I want to start by thanking Bill and, and Betty and Jen, the current publishers and owners of the Bay Times, and the others who wrote the articles in the San Francisco Bay Times in June and then in the current issue, in the September whatever number it is issue, about the history. I also want to thank Tricia Delara, who is the archivist at the uh, GLBT Historical Society, for digging up the files and scanning so many of them. <coughs> Excuse me. To Nalini Elias and Jeremy Prince for technical coordination and support here at the museum, and to Susan Calico, sitting right next to me, <coughs> who was the production manager of the original Bay Times and the production manager and the designer of the slideshow you're about to see. <clears throat> okay, so the first Bay Times, this is a visual history, not the history. <laughs> this is going to concentrate on the 40th anniversary of the first San Francisco Bay Times, which is what I know best because I was founding news editor and I was part of the group that Roland Strombari and Bill Hartman gathered together to put together a newspaper by lesbians and gay men. There is a continuity with the San Francisco Bay Times that we know today. There was also a short period of discontinuity near the beginning that also happened at a business, organizational, legal entities level which, which corporate level, which is also true. If you ignore the discontinuity, you don't understand the full and the, what what really happened. And if you ignore the continuity, nor do you. You need to look at both. Yes. So, having said that, why did we want a new newspaper in San Francisco in 1978? Cheryl, this was the status quo ante, what we were facing in 1978. What were the newspapers available? And remember, this is newspapers in an era when we didn't have the internet, we didn't have the web, we didn't have apps, we didn't have, we didn't have radio and TV. <laughs> there was slight incursions into radio, none into TV. I was working on a radio show at KSAN-FM, the rock and roll station at the time, <coughs> called The Gay Life, back when gay was an umbrella term, no longer is. And Roland was on Fruit Punch at KPFA. Um, Bill worked on Zodiac News Service. So we had The Advocate. Wow. The Advocate, to its credit, was professional, but it was national not regional or local, so it had only limited Bay Area coverage, and it was largely, but not completely orient, male-oriented, as this typical cover, this is a 1978 cover, <coughs> to show you. It was the Bay Area Reporter. It was local. It's probably less local now, and a little bit more actually California-wide, but very, very male-oriented. It was kind of hobbled by the fact that, for economic reasons, it had to sell its front page for advertising. Like, not put ads on the front page, but like, have the front page be an ad. And the news coverage was, from a journalistic standpoint, spot. <laughs> <laughs> it was the Sentinel, which, as you can see from this, was actually a full-size newspaper relying on that large newspaperish look to, to add a little bit of credibility to it. It's wider actually than the current San Francisco Chronicle because what's considered a full-size newspaper, even for a, one of those ones that you open like the New York Times or the Washington Post, has narrowed. And it was generally for a queer publication a little bit ugly and undesigned. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we had the Crusader, which was, this is from May of 1978. It was sporadic. It was male-oriented. To its strength, it was serving the tenderloin better than the other publications. To its weakness, it wasn't serving the entire community in terms of its coverage. 
or its advocacy or whatever. Was that Ray Brochier? It was published by Ray Brochier, <laughs> a known mm -hmm. troublemaker at the least, mm -hmm. and possible Ajahn provocateur mm -hmm. with no direct links to the CIA, but links to organizations <laughs> like the National Student Association that had been CIA infiltrated. Um, there were other sporadic publications like the Calendar, which I haven't pictured here. That's Calendar with a K. <laughs> there was also, and this is, this is kind of interesting, a new publication called The Gazette, which, about which we did not know when we started the Bay Times. And they were starting at the same time, in the spring of 1978. Neither team knew about the other until the plans and teams were well underway. And it's possibly one of the reasons that neither of the publications survived the year. It had professional content and look. It was intended to come out five or six times a week and to be oh, wow. basically wow. daily wow. for the lesbian and gay communities. It started at three times a week then declined to, and then one, and then disappeared. As I said, it didn't, didn't make it out of the year. But I sometimes wonder, I wondered at the time, had we known if those two groups had found out about each other earlier, could a single new publication have survived in 1978? So 19... 1978 is the founding of the first Bay Times, and one of the reasons for it was that teachers were threatened. In fact, all school workers were threatened. Lesbian and gay teachers and school workers. And if you were a janitor at a school, you could, if Proposition 6, about which we have this wonderful exhibit that Paula, who was here, where Paula sitting back there? Paula was one of the co one of the co-chairs of Bacabi, the Bay Area Committee Against the Greek <coughs> Initiative. Proposition six would have made it would have required the firing of any teacher or school worker who is known to be a lesbian or gay or a roommate of family member. Uh, it was really this huge wide loop. And it wasn't just about teachers, it was about teachers, guidance counselors, everything, right all the way up to janitors. Who's this skinny kid on the cover? That's Tom Amiano. Oh. 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 Yeah. The idea of the teacher's threat, and we didn't quite get it quite right. We wanted to kind of show him the teacher, the teacher being labeled lavender, then only the lavender, then disappeared. Oh. That, that, that's, that's what was likely to happen. This was a 12-page sampler issue that we produced in May of 1978 to assist our fundraising. Um, today we would call it a beta release. Then we called it a sampler. Um, the front page, that was just the cover. It folded over and then it opened up into a front page. The front page had plenty of news, some of it about the Briggs Initiative, bottom left, initiative threatens teachers. This was coming out before the parade. There was, uh, there were uh, LGBT, well not, LGBT wasn't used then. There were lesbian and gay rights bills um, in Berkeley uh, that, that were coming before the council and one in San Francisco at the same time. We were trying <coughs> to cover not only lesbians and gay men, <coughs> The B was just, the B of bisexuals just beginning to bubble into consciousness as being part of our political community. T was yet to come. But we were also trying to be equally cognizant of the fact that San Francisco was not the whole Bay Area. Things were happening in Berkeley and elsewhere, elsewhere in, in the Bay Area. So here's, here's a story that explains what it is we were trying to do. The term we used then was co-sexual. Today we would say multi-gender. <clears throat> we wanted to have news of the allied communities and struggles, also of women, minorities, labor. Um, we recognized that, as, as Dell said, that 
women and men have different issues, uh, but that politically there were a lot of a lot of struggles that tied us together and tied us to other groups that were working on on, on political issues. Uh, today, what we would call the progressive political issues, that we had these things in common. We also realized that, however, yes, we did have different ones. So, oops, I double clicked there. Sorry. We, the women on the collective asked for, the, we should have a separate women's page. And the men said, that's great. Yeah, we should have a separate men's page too, because there are things we want in a newspaper that you're going to not want to look at. <laughs> and you can look at them. There are things that you're not going to be, you're not going to be interested in some of the things we talk about. They're there, you can look at them, but they're labeled. So it's up to you. It's, it's, it's a culture of choice. It's, it's all there. And, and although we, we were inspired by groups in Boston, like what was gay community news, and remember the word gay was still to some extent, was going out of, gay was going out of, out of fashion as an umbrella term, just as the era of lesbian separatism being the dominant stream in lesbian activism was receding, and there was this desire to work together with other communities, namely men, who had similar political issues, similar, similar issues of rights, and who felt the same threat <coughs> of anti-queer activists like Anita Bryant, 1977. In 1978, in Anita Bryant, we lost an important uh, referendum in Florida that would be, and wound up repealing a gay rights mm -hmm. A human rights ordinance, no one was still saying LNG or lesbian and gay. And then there were elections that we lost in Wichita, St. Paul, and Eugene in the spring and summer of 1978. Things looked very threatening for us, and we were threatened together. It was, it was time to work together. So women's times, men's times. We got to run this lovely picture by Efren Ramirez. Uh, talk about issues that were men's issues, issues that were women's issues. And we had plenty of arts coverage. MJ Lalo, who was supposed to be on the panel, who couldn't make it I hear because of a, a death in the family, was the arts editor. And um, this is, uh, that's the opening of the thing, arts and entertainment. And we had lots of volunteer help from the community. This is a blow up of the first staff page. <laughs> and if you look in, into that, you will see names, like Cleve's name is there as a, as a founding contributing, as a contributing writer. This is the first issue that makes him a founding contributing writer. Um, Arthur J. Bresson, the filmmaker, a lot of these names, especially half of the men did not survive the AIDS epidemic. Um, you can look through, I mean, the names are just rich, rich, rich with, with the, the talent of our community. So that one came out in May. We were trying to raise funds. Uh, we were a nonprofit. Not only were we quote unquote pro sexual, we were not for, pro not for profit. That raised a little bit of antipathy in the business community who thought, well, why should you not have to pay the same kind of taxes that we're paying um, just by saying it's not profits, we're, you know, we're pulling it back in. Not that we ever made anything in surplus. So we did come up with a second issue. Right in time for the LGBT parade, which was then called the Gay Freedom Day Parade. This is Gay Rights and Eclipse. It shows a moon overlaid with a picture of activism. Visually, it doesn't quite work. There's a little bit too much ink on the page. Um, we were kind of rushing ahead of ourselves in our wisdom and knowledge and everything. And partly we were rushing ahead, we were way rushing ahead of having the budget to do things properly. But we were rushing because 1978 was a year of crisis. Mm -hmm. the, the existence of our community was at stake. And that's what this wonderful exhibit over here that, that's worthy of an entire separate visit to the museum about the Briggs Initiative in 1978. So that, that, this is the, that was the cover. That was the cover. This is the front page. What about the 25 cents? Well, that's another thing. Is everything else, the advocate charged. All of the local papers were free. We were trying to start a 
cash per issue or subscription basis so that we wouldn't be advertising dependent. It was a big <coughs> idea. We were naive. <laughs> we, in fact, we printed 50,000 copies of this issue to sell at Cape Pride, which had, had 250,000 people at that year. We didn't sell 50,000 issues. <laughs> I don't think we sold 2,000. Oh. Um, but as I said, we were, we were eager, we were enthusiastic, and we also felt political crisis. So this, this is an article on that that's got two bits of Stonewall history. One about all of the things that happened in, in lesbian and gay history before Stonewall. And a first, that's by Sam Blazer. And we also have a first person account of the 1969 event by New York activist Morty Manford. Um, we read a good article. Well, let me. We read an article by me. I think it's good. And this is about that famous picture from the 1977 parade, the most photographed image of the 1977 parade, which occurred about a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks after the Anita Bryant victory and the loss for the lesbian and gay communities in Miami Dade County. And someone had these, came up with the five signs. It's, it's also in the exhibit there. That, sh that show um, Idi Amin is on the, on the far right and a burning Ku Klux Klan, and then on the other side there's <laughs> Stalin and Hitler, and Anita Bryan in the middle as merchants of hate. And this told the story of the group that was behind it, um, just as a background story to, to do it. So um, we had a sense of the history that was already behind us even as we were participating in it. And then we had an editorial on that issue by Del Martin. Wow. Um, um, Yay. Pioneer. Pioneer recognized by nearly everyone. The late, the late and great Del Martin. Um, founder with, 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 um, with Phyllis Lyon of the Daughters of Belitis, the first openly specific out of the closet, we're here lesbian organization in, in the early 1950s uh, that started as a little social circle and became a major political force. That a, we have a whole exhibit and a permanent exhibit about that. And this is Dell rallying the troops and calling together women and men to work together to defeat the Briggs Initiative and all of the other enemies that are out there, not only of our community, but, and not only on the lesbian and gay issues, but on the feminist issues, on the labor issues, on the economic issues, on the, the people of color issues. It's all there. It's a, it's a, one, it's a, it's a wonderful editorial or op-ed that she wrote that, that we ran in this issue. And then something that begins to look, oh. this was the centerfold calendar of the Bay Times, of events, so that people could connect with each other. Remember, no internet, no apps. Uh. There are organizations, if you're political, you might be very culturally inclined to be a member of one little group or another, but this was like, here are, here are the things in our community. And this was something, This the idea of the calendar was something that Bill and Roland, again, I'll say their names again, Bill Hartman and Roland Shambari, were totally committed to and, and wanted, wanted to make happen. Um, remember, remember that design because it comes up again later. Then we had a full page ad from uh, KSAN, the rock and roll station where I was working on the radio show called The Gay Life, um, advertising live parade, live coverage of the parade. They ran it live that year from the parade and the celebration from a remote truck. Um, for mainstream commercial media at the time, that was uh, an important thing. Now, of course, we, it's just a question of which station bids the highest to get the television rights to show the parade with Donna <laughs> as, as, one of, as one of the co-anchors to explain to the, more, to the wider communities 
what it is they're seeing in front of them. Nice. Um, but it was new then. And also, KSAM uh, was fully behind this project, uh, thanks to Larry Lee, um, who's, who's there. Larry's, Larry's on the right, uh, sitting down. Um, this, was the, this is the news. It was progressive, inclusive news. And that included um, freedom for everyone. Um, we had other ads. We have this one. This is notable for two <coughs> reasons. The, this is an ad. Uh, it, it, it quotes a, uh, it lifts a column from the Chronicle from Margot Pattis and Doss, who wrote about the Bay Area, with an app called Let Us Not Praise Hayes Valley, with rentals. And if you look closely at what those rentals were cost, <laughs> can people see what the rentals were Please in Hayes Valley in, <laughs> in 1978? The other interesting thing is, our, our office was in Hayes Valley at 613 Laguna Street. So what this represents, by the way, is that ad was placed for free or in barter against the fact that we were paying little or nothing for our rent. And at the time, and still today, radio stations do it, publications do it, a lot of advertising is not cash, it's barter. Ah. Where there's where you're trading one service for another, or one even one product for another. Um, the interesting thing about our office at 613 Laguna, that's, that's at Laguna and Hayes. It's on the west side of Laguna, just north of Hayes. Because that building is very important in film history. It was used as a location in Eric von Stroheim's 1924 classic masterpiece, Greed, which in turn was based on Frank Norris's 1899 novel, McTee. It represented Polk Street, so there's another, another little queer thing, a Polk Street dental office. But that building, Polk Street, had long since, well, Polk Street burned in the, in the fire. So in 1924, you couldn't use Polk Street to represent Polk Street. You had to go to a neighborhood outside the 1906 fire area and show what it might have looked like. But also, just, a, just the same year that the Bay Times moved into that building, it was used, it was a pizza parlor in the 1978 comedy uh, Foul Play, which starred Chevy Shakes. And it was a, it was a pizza parlor, and uh, it's a wonderful movie. It has Cyril Magnin as Pope. <laughs> um, what, what would the Red have been? The, what would our, our office rent have been? What some of these rents? I can somebody rent for 300 hmm. The lowest is $150. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's a studio. Yeah, you spent that between where I came from to get here. Yeah. Uni and groceries. Yeah. And then the back subscription form. I think we maybe uh -huh. got a few hundred subscriptions before things petered out. Okay, so we got one we, despite the fact of having 48,000 unsold issues, we did manage to put out a third issue with a more modest press run. This is uh, the, the issue number three. This is the third and the last final issue. Um, That's the news. We pointed out that what we could still call Gay Day, at least in a headline, although if you look underneath, this is a newspaper by lesbians and gay men. It was not called the Gay Times. It was the Bay Times, a newspaper by lesbians and gay men. And there's a photo of the crowd at the 1978 parade. Wow. That's what it looked like. Woo! Uh, most coverage by, by most news organizations at the time, both, both those within our community and those outside, if they focused on what was on stage, if they were covering the celebration <coughs> as opposed to the parade. And I always thought that, you know, this is really about the parade. What's on stage is the hook. It's, it's the vein. It's the click vein, we would say today. The story is the crowd. And because we were small size, you know, like about the size of the current Bay Times, actually, 
<clears throat> that didn't run too big. About three years later, when I was editor of the Sentinel, I got to run that photo, a photo of the 1982 parade across a centerfold of a large size thing. Because I always thought the story is the people, the multitudes. Mm -hmm. So we had a great story in this um, about the influence of lesbians, gays, bisexual people, and trans with on black gospel. This is a totally groundbreaking article. Um, and um, a really, really, really great thing. And believe it or not, that isn't the whole issue. The whole article ran, ran over onto another page. So the question who is, who wrote it? Uh, Roland, Roland Shavari, who was really into it and who knew <coughs> Emmett Powell, um, who was just a, a famous gospel singer, who was just on the verge of coming out at the time, and who had a restaurant on called uh, Emmett Place. Um, on, 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 uh, on, Hayes, on Hayes Street back in those days. So what happened was, um, let me go back to that for a minute. Uh, we, as I said, there was the political crisis that forced us to come out. We never had a real revenue stream. No one was paid on the staff. Uh, I and I think some others actually lent some of their own money, which never got repaid. There were thousands of hours of work. We had, there was new competition, as I pointed out, not only the existing situation, but new competition from the Gazette. There was a resistance to our nonprofit model from potential business advertisers. Um, the idea was probably slightly ahead of its time, and uh, we suffered, or at least I feel we suffered, from naivete and inexperience. Uh, in 1979, <coughs> Amson Reinhardt, um, who was our legal uh, counsel, told us it's time to wind up the affairs of this nonprofit corporation. And the first Bay Times came to its end as uh, it was a nonprofit corporation uh, with outstanding debts and brought to its conclusion. Wow. However, this is Bill Hartman. He's on the left, Roland's on the right. Uh, this is a photograph by Rink Rinker. Are you still here? Range, right here. Yeah, there you go. Oh, right here in front of me. Okay. Um, this, this is, I think this is a Halloween photo where Bill is some kind of. Count Dracula or something, but uh, Bill and Roland wanted to try putting something out, at least a calendar or something, on a less involved, less big finance needed, less, less needing to incorporate or anything. And they came out with, in October of 79, a publication called Coming Up with an exclamation mark, but the month actually has more prominence than the title. And if you look at that, again, now this was a full socks, like Times, Washington Post, LA Times, Chronicle, bigger actually because full size and then was, those days was bigger than now. That's what the whole page looked like. Looked like they got a good deal of advertising to mix it up. <clears throat> They have an article explaining why Halloween is a gay holiday by Arthur Evans, leading theorist and historian of queer witchcraft. Um, and a wonderful, full size, two full sheets. It was a four page publication, the original one. This was the middle. This is pages two and three of the four pages. With, there it is, the calendar. The most important thing Bill and Roland felt, the most important thing was to tell people where we could find each other and on what basis, what kind of things were happening elsewhere. <coughs> that the community was not entirely about bars and pickups. It was about community, culture, and arts, and political organizing. The similarity to the original Bay Times calendar is not a mistake. Bill and Roland did that Bay Times calendar. So 
<clears throat> this kind of continued, and, but, but Bill and Roland figured, we need, we need to get the co-sexual part of this. And they, they, they tried and cajoled and even wooed Kim Corsaro, who was one of their mm -hmm. photographers, to get involved in the production of it. Uh, and according to Kim's story, Bill even would come over with flowers to <laughs> Kim's house. So that's why I said to actually wooing her. Please be, please be part of this. Hey, Randy. Yes. That previous slide also, I get, had an ad for uh, the very first national march. Yeah. There, yeah. right there and there. Yep. That's it. There you have it. That's on her On my birthday. <laughs> So, so this is the first issue in which not only had Kim Bid enlisted, but she actually took the publisher's title. Um, and um, it's interesting, it's June of 1981. It's interesting because, let's see if I can use the pointer correctly. Well, if you look up in the lead story, why we should march, this happens to be my maid. When, when, when Patricia at the archives dug this out, and I said, why did you pick this one? Did you just show it to me because you, you found my name? And she said, no, 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 that was Kim Corsero's first issue where she was listed as the publisher. She was listed at earlier mastheads as a contributor and a photographer and working on production. But in this one, she became the publisher in a run that was going to last 30 years. Okay. However, and also elsewhere, I'm not sure if it's on the front page, but later, um, oh no, it's later that happened. But June 1981, for those of you with long memories, June 5th, 1981 was when the CDC published the first reports of a mysterious cluster of cancers among gay men in urban centers on the west and east coast. About 15 or 16 months before the name AIDS was settled on as a description of that syndrome. <clears throat> so it continued in this format, by the way, until December of 1983. The candlelight memorial on the left refers to the Milk Moscone Memorial, organized annually by Cleve and Associates in November, and then an announcement, actually not an announcement, the se part of second. Again, you can see from the fact that this is part two of this story about the Jewish Feminist Conference that the room for news wasn't that large when you were putting together just the big four-page issue, or sometimes six, or maybe eight, uh, but you had to have a calendar in the middle. That's what the whole page looked like. Uh, looking forward to the um, to the uh, the holidays coming up. <clears throat> that was the last issue in the big full size issue because in January 1984 yes. it returned, it became a tab. <clears throat> and over the years, it became eventually much more like a newspaper, which. The, the tabloid got thicker and thicker, and there was absolutely key journalistic work <clears throat> done on AIDS and other issues, but AIDS being really kind of, again, the new existential threat to the community. In the 80s and 90s by Tim Kingston, uh, John S. James, Michael Hellman and Rick Osman, and, and many, many others. It was a really important resource and source in, in the community during the 80s and 90s and the AIDS thing. So, so, so far we've seen, as I've said, we saw that there was a discontinuity, but we see that, the, that when Bill and Roland said, well, let's just do a calendar, the calendar itself grew into a newspaper that began to echo the themes and interests of the original Bay Times. So, in, in 1989, in March of 1989, you'll see that um, this is the last issue that was called Coming Up. And, it, and if you look even 
In 1989, the front cover is what activates the pointer here. There it is. Yeah. Over here, it no longer says that it's a calendar and newspaper. It's now a newspaper and calendar. It's evolved mm -hmm. along the way. Because one month later, it became the Bay Times again. Yeah. Uh, Sisters. Absolutely. In March, in, in April of 1989. And this is the first issue following the name change. And the interesting thing about this issue is it's actually co-branded. Because it has the new Bay Times logo across the top and the old coming up left just so that if anybody missed the announcement before that there was going to be big changes coming in the new year. But this was it, the Bay Times, with an article honoring the 10th anniversary of the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. Um, and, and an article inside by Kim Corsero explaining what you know, a letter to the readers explaining the name of change. Once again, it emphasized the continuity of the first Bay Times coming up and of coming up to the newly renamed Bay Times. We have the continuity of personnel, Bill, Bill Hartman, Roland Shambari, and, and to quote some of the language in that, it talks about, it says that the first Bay Times was precedent setting in its devotion to covering the diversity of the gay lesbian community. It was the spirit that Hartman and Shambari who both worked on the Bay Times sought to capture when they started coming up. And it is that spirit, in that spirit, that we continue to publish. That was, that was the separation. So you see that, like, as I said at the beginning, there's both, there was, there was a business discontinuity, but there is a definite spiritual continuity recognized by Kim explicitly in, in, this, in this letter and so forth. And Randy. Yeah. Rick Gerhardt is Rick. listed on that page. Yep. Woohoo! Yep. In the yes. Yep. Hey. So this is interesting. This is the last. This is the last monthly issue of. No, actually, this isn't the last. One. This is the first fortnightly issue. So after having been a monthly from 1979 to to um, September of 1991. In 1991, it became, it came out every, started coming out every two weeks. I like the word fortnightly because it's explicit. If you say bi-weekly, even, under, even, you know, does that mean twice a week? Or <laughs> <laughs> and does that mean, wait a minute, is it just for bisexuals? <laughs> so I'll say fortnightly. But it, it started coming out every two weeks instead of once a month on September 26, 1991. And in addition to the general news of the community and, and the news about AIDS and HIV and, and, and AIDS activism, it had classified ads that linked to telephone numbers. Now, previously, this is again, it's pre-Craigslist, pre it's pre Craigslist. It's pre Grinder, it's pre everything. It's a landline. <laughs> and, then this was, and this was a new technological advance over having to mail in to a box number. You could phone up for 96 cents a minute. That's about a dollar seventy-five a minute for today's wow. money. And and leave a mess and listen to the voice of the person who had placed it. And and, and you could leave a, a message to the self. This happens to be from April of 1992. It was until the advent of, of the internet in the late 90s for the community, and there were, there were ads. There was a section of men seeking men, women seeking women, mixed romance, strictly platonic. I forgot what all the categories were. But, so again, you did not have, you did not have to see anything you did not want to see. But my, my, both my experience of having spoken to people is most people kind of glance through the other sections too, just, just to kind of keep, keep in touch with what was going on in the other communities. So the next issue is a famous one. Uh, May 7th, 1992, 
after the Rodney King riots, our previously liberal and left, our, our left loving and previously thought to be liberal police chief who had been sheriff, Richard Hongisto, reacted and ordered his personnel very to respond very harshly to protests. Uh, Kim Krasara to this uh, imaginative, creative, very queer uh, cover, satirizing him um, and for the imposition of martial law. Uh, Hongisto did not like being challenged and uh, ordered, allowed, <laughs> winked at, arranged, uh, allowed it to happen. It, it, it's, a, it's, it's like when King Henry said, will no one rid me of this meddlesome priest, uh, did the exact extent to which he ordered it, condoned it, or whatever, <clears throat> is vague, except police removed all of the copies all yes. over the city from the free news rights. He told us he just wanted to make sure it was such a good article to pull us officers to read it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a reason on a free newspaper rack that it says, take one. One. If you take them all, it's theft. And the courts agreed with that, and in fact, come, the Bay Times wound up with a settlement that helped keep it publishing for quite a while uh, in, a, in, in an excellent bit of resistance against it. So, yeah, from Randy, Randy, people don't know this, Kim uh, was on the street, she lived in the Castro. Two policemen in uniform threatened her life, and she moved from the Castro down to Pacifica because she felt like they would actually do something to her. They towed her car over and over wow. again. Okay. I didn't know that's why she moved yeah. here. In so, case, didn't but you have a little something to do with this photograph? And the two people that took them out of the 7-Eleven were close friends of Dan White. One of them was an officer in oh. PLA. She got all in that guy. So Kim Crisero was the publisher from June of 1981 to August of 2011. 30 years, and it is absolutely impossible to overstate her huge contribution to our communities, to the city, and to the entire Bay Area. In the beginning, I thank the people who helped me put this presentation together. What's really needed in this is a big thank you to Kim Crisero for keeping the coming, keeping Bay Times coming up and Bay Times. <laughs> And, yeah? I just would like to add to that that I spoke with Kim this evening. And oh. she uh, was sitting in a hospital in Appalachia. What? Uh, she's on dialysis, waiting for a kidney. Oh, wow. And then she says she wants to come home. So I'll just like to pass that on. So a get well to Kim yeah. and a speedy finding of the donor. So this is an issue from the transitional period of June to August of, of um, 2011, when Kim passed the reins to, to Betty and Jen, uh, who are the current publishers. Who's here? Where, where We're is here. Betty and Jen. Uh, in a very rational, orderly, two-month transition, and that's been now uh, seven years, which brings us oh. a whole <laughs> current issue. And not only is Donna here, look, it's, she's in the, yeah. I wore the same suit for the same suit. It's the only suit you got. That's no, 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 it's under roast, yeah. No, I mean, no, that is her 40th anniversary of <laughs> Times outfit. Yeah, yeah, a very good one, thank you. That brings us right up to the front. One history. Wow. Yeah, that's that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
the core group. Um, Priscilla Alexander, Yay. who was a member of Coyote, and uh, she took over the women's page and produced that. And then MJ Wallow, who was the arts and entertainment editor, who we're sorry to say couldn't be here tonight. So they they were doing, and Randy and others were doing a lot of writing of articles and taking pictures and you know all that kind of stuff. And I was trying to get it produced uh, in terms of typeset. And I think we had some. Uh, sometimes when we got our some of our stuff typeset by our competitors, uh, I don't know whether they knew or not, uh, but uh, anyway, um, we got it. We managed to get it done. We had we had a lot of there was a lot of activity. People were just doing stuff because there weren't so many of us. There were volunteers, and that was great. Um, I had previously done, spent a number of years at KPFA, so um, the groups there were very, very radical, people who were there. So there was a third world department by the time I got there. There were two lesbian programs. There was Women's News. There were other women's programs. And um, so I, with, I, I decided I came out about that time, so I decided I wanted to join the station because I knew there were lesbians there. I had been broadcasting, and that was pretty exciting. So I joined Women's News because I was already in the news area. But when I tried to, you know, like make contacts with the women in the lesbian group, because I wasn't really out, um, they really didn't want to have too much to do with me or women's news. So that was how radical it was. So when I came, when Roland, who was at Fruit Punch, and who I knew was the station, talked about this newspaper, I thought, well, this is going to be good. So I got involved and came over. So I was used to, uh, I was used to the very radical and very separatist types of politics. And this wasn't like that, which actually suited me because I felt like, as, as did many other people with Briggs, with Anita Bryant, and all that stuff going on, that we really needed to work together. Um, and mostly, I was working on production, trying to make things actually happen, doing some editing and things like that. So um, I didn't actually have to deal with politics too much, which was a nice profession change. <laughs> But we had, um, well, I, I, I just, I wanted to say, seeing all these issues of the different incarnations, that my favorite issue, and I believe it was still the Bay Times at that point, sometime in the early 80s, when, the, when there was um, a kind of conflict or, you know, there was, the, talk about the don't ask, don't tell policy in the military, and that was that was starting to be changed, or at least being discussed. The Bay Times put out an issue on the front page. I can't remember what the picture was. I think it was a person, the person the I, I can't remember exactly, but the, uh, the headline was ask, tell, pursue, which <laughs> I actually put on my I put that phrase on my printer. I cut it out and put it on my printer because I thought that was great because of the don't ask, don't tell, don't pursue policy. It's like, no, you've got that wrong. Let's do ask, tell, pursue. So that was my favorite cover of the others. Um, while I was looking through my issues of the Bay Times that we produced, the three issues, and my archives, um, I found a very nice uh, Perspectives that we did very tastefully done. Um, obviously, it didn't raise enough money, but we tried. And I also found a letter, a copy of a letter that I wrote to my mother <coughs> at that time. And I thought, and given my experience at KPFA with the collectives, because everything was a collective within the station, <laughs> and coming to this group, which was 
basically kind of that. I mean, I don't know what else. We might not have called ourselves that, but really, here we were all together doing this. Um, I, because of my experience, I just wanted to read a little bit from that letter because it kind of, I think it kind of said the point at the, how we were feeling. It, it kind of described how people were feeling at the time where we put out three issues and we were in big trouble financially. Um, so I told my mother, we are going through a re reorganization at the Bay Times. Well, it was triggered by a financial crisis, but really it has more to do with lack of management, at least in my opinion. People are very upset and irritable and snappy because everything is so uncertain. I, I can see how if we had established the proper organization and set up decision-making procedures, much of this could have been avoided. Of course, maybe, maybe not, but you know, that was my opinion at the time. Um, I've, research, I've been researching various organizational possibilities for nonprofit newspapers, and my research has taken me to business libraries, the Small Business Administration, and the New School for Democratic Management, and two members of collectives all over the Bay Area. I don't know much about business or business administration, but I find that this fascinating. I've come up with some interesting possibilities for the makeover of the board and the organization of the actual newspaper. The only hitch is that probably no matter what I propose to other members of the group, they probably won't accept it. We're at the point of where no one wants to leave and no one wants anyone else to leave. I'm getting sick of collectives, I can tell you. <laughs> so any of you who have ever been in a collective know what I mean. <laughs> um, what I think will happen is that we will expand the board, which is one thing we all agree is needed. Uh, people with some sense will come in, come in, and because they're outsiders, they'll be trusted and finally we'll get something done. I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'm, very, I'm excited about what I'm learning, but I'm depressed because I can't really do anything about it. Without any agreed upon rules, I have nothing to use as leverage, even to get my ideas considered or to initiate any action. Yet I know we can't afford to sit by hoping that something or someone will save us. It's just us here. So things were in a pretty bad state when we left, and it's just amazing that Roland and Bill pulled things out and went on somehow with the bare bones. Um, I think that was truly inspired, you know? Because people were really pretty down about the whole thing. We tried, we failed, what will happen? <coughs> so um, that's a part of the history, too. That, But if you don't try, you're never going to do anything. And clearly, as Randy has shown us, the ideas that were there rose from the ashes, almost literally, and became, and continued. It, and continue to serve the lesbian and gay, and gay community and all the rest of the letters that we didn't have then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, have you written another letter to your mother? Tell her <laughs> it survived? Well, it, you know, I at that time, eventually I just sort of was involved with other things. I had to get a job. The one good thing that the Bay Times gave me, no salary or anything like that, but I did get experience doing production, which I had done some of before. But I ended up going back to the Daily Cal, where I was also working. I had to go between KPFA and the Daily Cal. When it got too crazy in one place, I'd shift most of my attention to the other. I'd keep my, my, you know, my hand in. Um, but I, uh, it turned out that the Daily Cal, which had an in-house uh, typesetting and uh, um, part, it was sort of separate, but it was definitely, you know, they did some outside work. Uh, the person who had run that for all these many years, who was also gay, uh, decided he wanted to go do something else, and he did. So they were looking for somebody to run that, and I applied, and who knows why, but I partly because of my experience at the Bay Times, I got the job. This was all before desktop publishing. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Or LinkedIn. So, um, and then when I was there, a union came in, so everybody had to adjust to that. It was, it was a lot, but I, you know, 
I had some experience and I was willing to go with it. And I think a lot of community organizations give that sort of opportunity to people to get some experience in something that they know something about that they learn a lot. So how many years did you do, did you use your experience in a job? Um, well, I was already, of course, working on the newspaper, the Daily Cal, for many years. Uh, I, I worked as the production manager at the Daily Cal for a, about a year and a half. And I left then, and I can't remember whether I was sort of forced out or I left. It's a long time ago. It's hard to remember. <laughs> But um, I think because of the union, it caused a lot of stress with upper management. Mm -hmm. And there were actually adults there at the Daily Cal, not just students. Um, and so they, you know, I mean, it, it just, they just changed. And the Daily Cal has gone back on campus and gone off campus again a number of times in its incarnation. So, um, I, Susan, when you were working with the Bay Times, did, did you feel that you were part of a pioneering or a, a cutting edge effort, or just basically you were trying to put out a, a newspaper? Or you just really, do you feel a sense you really were doing something different that nobody actually done before? Well, I guess, I mean, we did feel like that, but I, you know, I'm kind of, you know, when you're on the production end, you kind of, you're, you're really busy just doing stuff. Mm -hmm. And other people are giving you content and you're making it come out. So you kind of, you know, I had more of that focus <coughs> at that time. I was political. I mean, I wouldn't have been a KPFA if I hadn't been. But, you know, I, and I was glad that we were doing something that we, you know, could, could produce. We could, we could serve a community that was our community. Um, it was sort of weird in a way because I think the men got teased by other men. <laughs> I remember Randy came back one time and said, well, they were telling us we smelled like fish. <laughs> and I said, oh. what? I said, what do you mean? Because <laughs> it, it wasn't my community. <laughs> so I didn't have really much experience there. But, um, you know, we just, we, we showed that it could be done. You know, I mean, Randy and I have kept up our Connection all these years, and um, you know, thank you. I would like to bring forward Betty Blender, uh, who some of you may know as Cleve Jones, who is <laughs> also involved in, in these things. So please, okay, now you can tell me a better story. It was Thanksgiving 1973, maybe, and I was living in a commune in the Cape Ashbury, and we had a, a big feast, and I was dating some guy that worked in a juice bar, and he had a big industrial blender, and I went out and I bought mangoes and papayas and pineapples and oranges and yogurt and LSD, and I put it all together <laughs> and served it, and I was known as Betty Blender for about a decade after. Uh, one of the memories that was jarred loose by this uh, wonderful slideshow was Priscilla Alexander, who when I first met her was not out as a lesbian woman, but was very involved with Coyote, the uh, organization that was fighting for the rights of sex workers. I mean, long before, I mean, now, I think it's, it's sort of, we understand that, that there is this fight for the rights of sex workers. Back then, it was really cutting edge, and Priscilla and I asked for a meeting with Captain Jeffries from the Mission Station because just a couple of weeks before the Dan White verdict came out uh, in May of 1979, there was a little mini riot down here on Castro Street when the photographer Guy Guy Corey, Guy Corey I love your memory, uh, was putting up posters and one of the rental cops uh, that patrolled the neighborhood at the time attempted to arrest him and was immediately surrounded by a couple hundred really pissed off queens who were like throwing pennies and cigarette butts, and it almost turned into a riot. Wow. And Priscilla and I had both been hearing the same rumors about this all-white, all-straight jury that was going to decide Dan White's fate. And we got a, me a meeting with Captain Jeffries, and we went down to Mission Station, and 
we told him we thought there was going to be violence and that we believed that Dan was going to get off and that that was a real credible possibility and that we needed to plan. And, and Captain Jeffries pretty much just patted us on the head and, and said, well, please, you know, if there's a, a problem, you just get the crowd together and march down to City Hall like you always do. <laughs> 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 I said, okay. <laughs> Um, another thing that just sort of re comes to me is just, and thank you, Ben and Jen, for, for keeping this going, because as, as the world has changed and print uh, goes away and more of this is digitalized, I, I think it's important to remember what we had and how important it was, and really what we've kind of lost, because there's been references to gay community news out of Boston, I also remember body politic out of Toronto, and the kind of really in-depth scholarly reporting that simply does not exist in, in the digital world or is very, very rare. And uh, the kind of work that Tim was doing, you know, we just don't see it. When I, and I did prep for this a little bit by just kind of scanning the LGBTQIA777, whatever it is that we are now, uh, news sites, and was just, like the word count for those articles is 150. You know, no, there's just so minimal. And in Bay Times, we always had that opportunity for really in-depth, more scholarly look, you know, a deeper look. Um, it also reminds me of just how important these newspapers were to ambitious young people like myself. And back in those days, you know, I imagined that I would be running for office, and it was just so important for all of us to be present in these publications. Uh, to write letters. Uh, Arthur Evans really became famous by writing uh, 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 letters to the editor, signed as the Red Queen. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, so many of us really created our personas and uh, became leaders in the community through these publications that have largely uh, gone away. I have one question for you. Do I have it wrong in my book? The, the story I wrote, the letter I wrote to Howard Wallace about the riot in Barcelona, did you publish it? In the Sentinel. It was in the Sentinel. The Bay Times didn't exist yet. So one of the most important things that happened to me in my youth was uh, I went traveling, and I happened to be in Spain right after Franco died, and it was the very, very first uh, LGBT uh, manifestation. And there was this, with my boyfriend and I, his name was Wolf, he was German. And, uh, and we, we, just, we just happened to be in Barcelona walking around one day and we noticed all these butch women and guys with long hair and feathers in their ears and we're like, what the hell's going on? And suddenly there was this huge protest that was the first pride march in Spanish history and I just happened to be upon it and I, as I recall, I went back to my hotel and I mean, we were brutally attacked by the police and I... Uh, back to the hotel and washed the tear gas out of my eyes and wrote a letter to Howard Wallace, who I guess gave it to you. And that was the first, I think that was, that was one of the first times I ever was published. And that was a big deal to me. It was a really, really big deal. And I, I fear that young people aren't getting that kind of opportunity uh, as, as these did. And also, um, just the newness of it. and. The, the self-conscious awareness that we all had that we were creating new things that really hadn't existed before. And so again, you know, thank you for continuing this. It's important that these things don't just disappear. And if they end up disappearing, it's important that we remember them and that they be chronicled in the way that these kinds of publications help launch our movement, help bring us to where we are today, help uh, reveal all the different subsets of our community and give them a voice. It was powerful then, it was important then. I think it's just as important as it is today. So kudos to you for keeping it. Well done, you're in so much trouble tomorrow. Uh, girl. I'm not wearing this suit, I know that. Thank you. Thank you, Cleve. And, and really thank all of you for not only still reading, but still reading newspapers. That is remarkable. So thank all of you. Including Bill's excellent history column. And at this point, I'm honored the latest.
Donna uh, has yeah. had it. So, but, but she will she will address issues more current than 1940, which is about where I I typically <laughs> stop. Uh, so welcome, welcome, my colleague. But another colleague on the the Bay Times has been the person who is now our supervisor. So I'd like to hear from him.
which brings me to, you know, I started with my grat my sense of real gratitude to all the folks who, like, without knowing you were creating this world, probably, or without necessarily knowing, I mean, you were asked, did you know that you were doing this new crazy thing? And maybe people did, maybe they didn't, but the reality is that's what you were doing, and you changed the world. Um, so as I said, the, the great gratitude I feel about that, but the tremendous gratitude, again, uh, for Jen and Betty. Um, because it really what for me and the other columnists, the other, I know all the columnists, but the political columnists, Zoe and Alex and um, Peter Galata, you know, talk about young voices who should uh, really ought to be heard. I think Peter Galata is one of them. Um, you know, it's a, it's a great way to reach our community. And I don't think newspapers are dead. I think they're struggling. But I think the desire for that, you know, that paper that you can read that brings you news and opinions will remain. And I think, you know, um, I think the, the Bay Times and other, the newspapers that survive will continue to be read and continue to be relevant. We need to support them. They may not always survive in the same way that they did survive and they need to adapt. But I think they're very, very important. So happy to be here. Congratulations, Bay Times. Thank you, Jen and Betty. I know you realize how absolutely daring all of this was and continues to be, but there's still some work for people who write for papers and read papers and are willing to be daring. So thank you for reading papers and contributing to this struggle just by being yourselves. That's an amazing step and an amazing contribution all in itself. Uh, and I wish to thank the men and the women uh, to do that because I want to hear from the women next. Uh, we have saved her for last because she is so moving, and you're going to leave here with her words, which will be memorable, uh, because, but because she is a current contributor to the newspaper, we sort of go on chronological here. So, Commissioner, please. Uh, thank you. Well, I want to um, also thank um, Betty and Jen for keeping this incredible, it's a tradition. And I think that it's something that, that we, we, we really need to take, continue to take great pride in. I see the Bay Times and some of the other LGBT papers that have come and gone, but certainly the, the Bay Times as akin to or its development and its import, its importance to community, um, very similar to the black newspapers, African American newspapers that come and, that have come and gone. Why is that? Where is the symmetry? And for me, it's very important because we, it is very much about the pulse of the community. But it's often where we have an opportunity, community members, community leaders, just folks that have ideas, what have you, how we can connect and find each other. I don't care if you're in San Francisco, if you're in Detroit, if you are in Chicago, if you're in, you know, wherever you are. The black newspapers are still very important to a, a, a sense of community. It's a very important uh, institution. And so I think that there's some symmetry there. And so that's one of the things that I value about what the Bay Times is about as an African American, as a lesbian, you know. But I, I do want to say that um, um, I was not born in 1973, uh. supervisor, my friend. I was born in, I was born in 1965. I have a birthday coming up. I'll be 53 on October the 14th. I am three days after Cleve's birthday on October the 11th. Um, but that is significant to me because that is also the, the year of the, the Voter Rights Act. And when I look at that in relationship to the development of, an, of, of the, the, the Times, the LGBT uh, liberation movement, and how, again, all of our, these movements towards um, equal rights as a woman, as a person of color, uh, as a lesbian, to me, I'm 
constantly trying to, to not, it's not about pivoting or navigating, but where the, that intersectionality, and believe me, I actually hate that word. <laughs> I paid a lot of money. I, I paid a lot of money, or at least my parents did, for me to be educated enough as a sociologist to not have to use the word intersectionality, but because it is fashion and it does capture a certain spirit and intent and ethos about how we relate. And what I appreciate about the Bay Times in watching and uh, understanding more of its history, I know a lot of those, a number of those folks. Um, as I, I think I knew more of those folks that were mentioned, and they, maybe I had thought that I did. I miss Del Martin. She had always, she and Phyllis have always, have always been welcome in their home. And um, they had chili, a chili event every year that I was invited to, and Del was always able to tell me the worst, dirtiest jokes I had ever heard. <laughs> and then give me really good uh, advice and counsel uh, moving forward. But having said that, what I really appreciate about being part of the Bay Times now is it's really intent on having a diversity of voices in our community represented. I am never ever on time with my column. I'm just gonna just, it, it just, poor Jen and Betty, it, it just never works out that I get my column in by 6 um, p.m. on the day that it's due. But what I appreciate is that I'm able to have a, uh, still conversation that is heartfelt, uh, intellectual, um, on point, I don't know if I'm always the very best columnist in the paper, but what I appreciate is that space uh, to be able to really express, contemplate, um, jive a little bit, poke at some issues, nudge at things, maybe make a few people uncomfortable or angry or curse me out when I'm at the safe way, whatever. But that is a very sacred space, I think, for our community. And the fact that we're all here convened today to not only celebrate, but to continue to elevate the import, the importance of the Bay Times is really moving to me. So for me, there's certainly so many other ways in which we can now express ourselves. You kept referring to, well, this was before we had email or Twitter or, I mean, you know, let's not act as though we were writing on stone tablets, but at the same time, too, things, you know, certainly there are so many other types of media outlets where people are just, whatever thought comes to your mind, you just put it out there in the universe, and we have a president who does that, and so, so there's nothing that's ever really well thought. Even the idea of the letter that you share, uh, who writes letters? anymore. We email, we text each other, etc. But it's not to say that uh, a newspaper or a, a media function that the Bay Times provides is at all, I think, an, you know, anachronistic. I think it is, in fact, very timely. When we are right now uh, in a particular period, where journalism is under attack. And there are reasons why it's under attack for political gain or a particular type of, of um, notion that this particular president and some of his followers want to, to um, try to exact on our democracy. And we know that the First Amendment is sacred. And the fact that, say, that the Bay Times is, to me, just as important, just as important as the Washington Post, as the New York Times, yeah. okay? If we make it so, it is up to us. And I think that that is the community that I'm excited about being a part of. So whatever I, I'm able to submit, 
in Jen and Betty are kind enough to um, allow me to express myself and others to express themselves. Um, I really, especially where we are now, this has been a long week, folks, for me. Okay, I don't know about you, but it's been a long week for me. Okay, so this first time, I've not thought of anything <laughs> other than what's been going on in the Senate. But I take such great pride as well as um, just a real humility about being a part of where we are right now in our country's history, in the LGBT liberation movement, and the need to stand up for the First Amendment and for the practice, the understanding, and the cherishment of journalism. It's so important. So for that, uh, and many other things, but I'll just leave it at that, that is one of the reasons why I am very proud and very humbled and honored to be a part of this tradition. And um, I hope that we'll be here again in another uh, 40 years. Same thing. <laughs> that they can 
can access all this information. <coughs> but like Bruce was saying, is it accurate? Is it correct? It is in the Big Times. It is in the other publications because it favors our uh, you know, community. So it wants to be accurate, not disparaging. Read some of the, the, the blogs about from the right wing about uh, the LGBT community. It's, it's something else we can read because Susan has an announcement of a gift that's being made to the GLBT Historical Society. When we started working on, Randy and I started talking about this and started working on, you know, how, you know, getting the copies together. We found out that there were no scans, and there was nothing online about the original three Bay Times issues. So I didn't think it would be that hard to do that to get it, to get the scans made. It was, but by the, we got them made, and they're all right here. So we're going to give a copy of this to the historical society so that they can. <laughs> Whatever the time frame is to get it up online will be. If it is like Andrea is saying, she's grateful she has a way to express herself through the paper. I'm grateful to find out what she's expressing. I don't know about most of the communities that, that she is talking about. It's Tim. Yeah, Tim's got a question. Yeah, I just like to say I, I worked for the Bay Times from about eighty seven or so through ninety five. And Working at the Bay Times, was, I felt, one, it made me a good writer. I wrote a lot, and I got the chance to do that because I stumbled into the Bay Times from KPFA where I was a radio reporter. And the first story I did was on domestic partners in San Francisco. And I presented Kim with this massive thing that she sort of nearly fainted when she saw it, and then had to move it all around. And um, that first article was very emblematic of what the Bay Times did. It would write about stories to move an issue forward. She wrote that to put Harry Britt on the spot because nothing had happened about domestic partners. And there were a number of times that there was an issue that we felt that she felt was important and we felt was important that needed to be pushed forward to push the people on something or to um, try and stop the crackdowns on sex at some of the restrooms that the police were still doing. And it was, that's what the Bay Times did. It was, to me and to the people who were around the Bay Times, it was more than just a newspaper. It was both a newspaper that strived for like accurate stories but had no illusions about the objective. But it, it would operate in conjunction with the social movements of the time. And it's like basically, I, I kind of work hand in glove a lot of time with ACT UP, but I wasn't a member of ACT UP. And there were all sorts of issues like that. So that's what, to me, the Bay Times really succeeded in doing during that period. It was more than a newspaper, it was a standard bearer, and it achieved some amazing things. And I'm so proud to work with it, for all I'm so very grateful for Kim, Kim, Kim Grosser for all of her unique personality. She was, just, <laughs> she was a powerhouse and kept that theme going. So I just wanted to have that. Yeah, I just I just want to say that in I've had a lot of experience with community, you know, trying to with media, community media, and there's a lot of politics involved. Always, people have real different ideas sometimes. But I, the one thing I always kept in mind was if somebody is doing something, I may not totally agree with what they're saying, but they're doing it. And, I, and what am I doing? You know, I'm not doing it. So I try to make sure to honor those people who are who actually are putting in the work to let our communities have information and you know that communication. So and you know we weren't looking for supervisor wherever you are. We weren't looking for. Uh, we, I, I personally was not thinking about the children who would come up and be, you know, our next generation when we were putting out the Bay Times. But, 
you know, it, it is there, and, and you're here now, so please, you're, you're doing your work also, whatever it is. I think, I also think that people should do, you know, when you're doing volunteer work, when you're doing political work, you should figure out what really turns you on to do, because, you know, anybody can stuff envelopes, but not everybody can write and communicate well. And not a, everybody can interview well. Not everyone can take good photographs or... Uh, Make know. documentaries. Yes. And, and so whoever's doing it, more power to you. However, whatever age you are. I just wanted to really quickly, a number of things, to share some things that I, I really want to share. <coughs> I, I haven't even been, been able to share this with Betty and Jen. I have many, many stories about many, many things. Half of them include Cleve Jones, who I used to work with. But um, one, um, when I was working with Cleve um, at the Names Project Foundation and uh, it's more Memorial um, I led uh, an initiative where we would we went to South Africa and some other countries. But um, I took the Bay Times with me at that time. I didn't think much about it. I just was like, I, I think I just really kind of grabbed the Bay Times because I hadn't read it yet. And I was thinking I was going to read it on the plane and blah, 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 and that sort of thing. So I get to South Africa. I have it in my backpack or my bag or whatever. And I still have it with, it, with me as we're sort of moving about South Africa. And um, I don't think I really thought about it at that time, just bringing this in, and then a couple of other folks that were South Africans saw me with this paper. I wasn't trying to display or show off or anything. I was just trying to catch up. And um, just how much that meant to them. Now, I'm from Indiana. Okay. Grew up in Southern California. Came to San Francisco in 1991. And um, how much, you know, seeing just any modicum of information when you're out in Riverside County or when you're in Indiana, uh, and the fact that these papers exist, just as we all, I mean, I, I think many people can relate in this room, how that much that means to you. But when you're in South Africa, and you're dealing with some real serious shit, okay? Not who sat next to you, called your name in the lunchroom, at high school, but I'm talking about some real shit to get you killed. And you are looking at the, 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 the Bay Times and the AIDS Memorial Club. Man, I, I don't know, I, there's no word. I'm pretty articulate, but I can't describe that. The second thing, after Prop 8 passed, I um, had the pleasure of um, engaging in a, uh, the Harvard Kennedy school of government as a, as a fellow. Now, there were nine of us that were LGBT fellows, Native Internet fellows, in a class of about 69 people from all over the world. So these are people that are the chief of staff of some prime minister, or maybe some prime minister, or somebody that wants to be a prime minister somewhere, to mayors, to DAs, to congressional members, whatever, just a whole host of folks. And then yet again, I brought the Bay Times with me because I hadn't had a chance to read it and I thought I was going to read it on the, the airplanes. There's so much reading that I need to do on airplanes. I'm going to Seattle next week to the Out and Equal Workplace Summit. I've already got my little stack. I'm going to read nothing on no airplane. But I took it with me. Now, this was in um, not long after Prop 8 had passed. Other folks in this program were, one, absolutely incensed to find out that there were queer people in the program. Now, these are some people from some other countries. They were incensed. Not only were there queer people in the program, honey, we were organized as some kind of fellowship and out to do some sort of gay agenda work on them that 
they were ready to get their passports and go home. But I had the Bay Times with me. And then the, the, the place where I was staying, there were two other women. One was from Ohio, one was from um, Southern State. And once they found out that I was a lesbian, they freaked out. And they also saw that I had this Bay Times. It was in my room, and they saw, what, 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 what? what? I, I don't remember who was on the cover, but clearly it was about Prop 8. But the Bay Times allowed me it was a tool in which there was a lot going on that, that year. Obama had just been elected. We lost on Prop A. Uh, I was there on campus at the time when Skip Gates, Dr. Gates, Henry Louis Gates, was arrested trying to get in his own house. I was just two blocks away. Um, there was some other stuff going on at Harvard University. But it was the Bay Times. So just having it in hand, there were these guys from Ireland from India, and um, from New Zealand. Fully practiced homophobes. Could not bear the idea, they didn't know all that was going on in the US, they, they knew that I could get married and that was a good thing and whatever. But it was the Bay Times and having that, they said, I want you to look more about what's going on in our community. And being able to share that with them, I can't tell you enough how that helped to break ground. I am still in touch, at least with two of those individuals. Now, another really good individual out of that, he wasn't a homophobe, he was supportive, he did, wasn't totally immersed in our community. He will be the next governor of the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. Called Hella High Water. And that is my brother, Andrew Hill. He was with us, and he was with me. And he remember giving him that copy of the Bay Times before we left. And he, that was an opportunity. I mean, he's in Florida. I mean, you know, they got gays there. But that, I just wanted to share that in terms of just, it goes beyond and what that means and how that was a tool and a way in which to build some community understanding. The work's not done. The work is never done. We all have to still be pioneers. That's part of evolution. It is never done but we're getting to a better place. Thank you.